Okay, so it's 104, so I think I can start by saying that you should do, you should update with Git pool uh, to get the late, to make sure that you are up to date. And once you are up to date, we are going to talk about Kupai in the session. So in Python HPC, we are going inside the Kupai, you should not see the untitled that it was testing something. So it's only the Kupai notebook. So here it is. For the moment, let me close this. So I think we are good to go. Okay, should I start? Good. Good, okay. So as Vasilis uh, showed you previously, uh, computing on the GPU is not quite straightforward. So there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration when you want to make the transition from uh, computation performs on the performed on the CPU and when you want to move them to take advantage of uh, the performance of the GPU. Uh, so uh, in order to in order to compute something on the GPU, uh, it's not as straightforward as doing computation with NumPy. Here is where Kupai comes in, which more or less is a Python library, a matrix library, which is accelerated with NVIDIA CUDA. And without you having to do anything specific, it uses the optimized CUDA related GPU accelerated uh, libraries, which are QBLAS, QDNN, QRAND to generate random numbers, QSolver, QSparse, QF QFFT, and CCL. And thus it allows to to take full advantage of the computing power of uh, GPUs. And if you are used to uh, performing your computations with NumPy, then Kupai is quite straightforward to use. So the core component is the Kupai NDRA, which is the equivalent of NumPy NDRA, but from the GPU perspective. And it's highly compatible with uh, NumPy NDRA. It supports most of the, op of the operations that NumPy arrays uh, support. And more, more, moreover, it allows you to write user-defined kernels, uh, as you saw previous, like the number ones, and you can write your, your own kernels to execute on the GPU. And the good thing with, with Kupa is that the GPU kernels that they, it produces are optimized for the shapes and the D types of the given then arguments, the given arrays that you pass as arguments on the fly. So we start as usual, we make, uh, we perform our imports here. So uh, first of all, I have, of course, to enable a kernel that has to buy. And then I do my first import. So the typical NumPy import is import NumPy as NP. And with Kupai, it's to make uh, the difference, to make a distinction with NumPy, we do import Kupai as CP. Then this is just uh, an import that I do for Matplotlib so that uh, we can load it. And then I, as we saw yesterday, I load the Cython magic uh, cell command for the Jupyter notebook uh, because I want to be fair and compute some uh, uh, computational intensive stuff using Cython because otherwise it would not be fair just to use a completely a pure Python code and compare against the GPU. So let me see. Okay. Here, I, I will show you later also why I have to do this. So I define two context managers to be able to time uh, 
the execution, the time, the execution time of Kupai kernels. And as Vasilius mentioned before, we need to do that because otherwise the elapsed time that we are going to measure is the elapsed time of the kernel launch and not the actual time of the uh, kernel execution. So CUDA kernels are launched asynchronously. And if we want to synchronize them, we have to do it explicitly. And if we want to time correctly, we have to specify CUDA events and use them. And that's, this, that's also true with CUPI. So the computations, the, uh, when you're, you are launching kernel eggs with CUPI, you do it asynchronously. So you have to do that in order to measure correctly the time. Here also is just a, a wrapper of starting and ending a timer and timer, and it prints the elapsed time in millisecond for you. And I will use these context managers in, uh, in the following uh, presentation. So creating CUPI arrays directly on the GPU is really straightforward. So to create a CUPI array with dimensions 1000 by 1000 in CUPI, uh, we just use CUPI zeros like you would use uh, NumPy zeros and P zeros. And for another array, just like an NP array, and we would pass this an argument of a list of lists, we can define our CUPI array like that. So I'm printing here uh, the type of the array. So now it's CUPI core and the array and my array A is of type this and array B is this one. The difference now is that these uh, arrays are allocated directly on the GPU memory. So by doing that, we are not allocating on the CPU mem on the uh, main memory, but directly on the GPU. So we don't have to make an explicit transfer ourselves if we are using uh, the, the functions that CUPI provides. So these A and B are allocated on the GPU. And here I create a random 1000 by 1000. And you, I wanted to show here that operations like finding the mean value are pretty straightforward. You just use the mean method of the BRA. Now notice that uh, the mean value is this one, which is expected since this uh, produces uniform values. And notice here that the value of mu is not now uh, just a scalar, it's an NDRA. Although it's uh, just a single value, it's an NDRA. Also, the mean calculation that I performed here was performed on the GPU, not on the CPU. Since it was a CUPI array and I called a method of a CUPI array, the calculation has been performed on the GPU. Now, as I said in the beginning, uh, NumPy arrays and CUPI arrays are uh, more or less compatible. There are certain operations that do not work, but for the general typical operations, they are really compatible. So I define here an ACPU uh, random array, but this is allocated on the main memory since I'm using NumPy. And with this, a GPU is CUPI array, and I pass the NumPy array inside the CUPI array. It directly moves, it makes the transfer from uh, the main memory to the GPU. So when you are using an array that is defined on, on the CPU side, and you use it inside the creation uh, method, uh, the creation function of CUPI, then it makes the transfer explicit for you. And you see here, this calculation now was performed on the CPU since I used the method of a NumPy array. And this calculation was performed on the GPU. I can show you here also, although it will be very fast, uh, maybe we will be able to see it for 
yeah, it was really fast, but maybe you could see for just a fraction of a second that there was some computation that was uh, being performed on the GPU. So if I make my array larger, then you see that uh, this was performed on the GPU. You have the time now to see it a little bit. And if I look also at the GPU memory, you see now that there is memory occupied on the, on the GPU, which is occupied by the, by the arrays that I have defined up, up to this moment. So any questions up to now? I think that up to now it's really straightforward. Now I saw I showed you how we make the transfer uh, on from our host, which is uh, more or less the G the CPU and the main memory to the GPU by using this routine, the CuPy array and passing an NumPy array. Now, if we want to get a GPU array and copy it back to our main memory, there is this method here. GPU x GPU dot get. So I define a ones array, an array with uh, which is full of ones and dimension one thousand by one thousand here, and here with x CPU I get the array back to the CPU. So you see that the type of the CPU array that I got back uh, is directly uh, transformed to a NumPy and the array. So for as long as we are working on the CPU, we are working with NumPy arrays. When we move to the GPU, we are working with CuPy arrays. So, uh, one other method that you can see here is that CuPy is NumPy, but that more or less is the same and type of CPU arrays, NumPy and the array. So is this clear up to now? Good, good. Okay, so let me move on. So as I said before, most of the typical uh, NumPy computations that you would perform with arrays uh, are uh, supported by, by CuPy. So here I just uh, do X CPU and I define a random, uh, a random, a random with NumPy and F Y CPU is again a random from NumPy. I transfer these arrays to my to the GPU using CP array. And I do that so that I make sure that I have the same values. And then I perform matrix multiplication using the CPU and using the GPU. So I time both the first one with the CPU timer and the other one with the CuPy timer, which is the appropriate one, as I told you before. So let me run. So what's happening here? The first computation on the CPU took 96 milliseconds, while the second one was slower. So why is that? Does anybody have a clue? Okay, so let me run once again. Now you see the real time that the computation actually took. So the first time I called uh, this multiplication, CuPy uh, had to check and generate a kernel for this case. So the first time that ex I executed this, uh, the time also included the compilation, uh, the time that it needed to compile to a kernel. Also uh, note that for matrix matrix multiplications, CuPy will make use of CuBlas uh, without you doing anything, which is really optimized for that kind of operations. So let me run again. You see it's quite faster. Let me 
add some stuff here. Let me do it to 2000 just to have something bigger. So you see, it's 10 times faster, the computation. Again, we can perform another typical computation, which is uh, to solve a linear system. So again, again, here, just to make sure that I have the same uh, numbers, I first generate a random matrix and the random vector uh, using uh, NumPy. Then I move these vectors to the GPU, and then I can solve my linear system. So you see that it took 2,000 milliseconds, 2.2 seconds with the CPU and 1.3 seconds with the GPU. If I execute again, then we will see that it's even faster because now the compilation time to be to compile to a kernel is not needed anymore since it's uh, it's have been done and we have called it with the same type of uh, arguments. So any questions? I don't think that uh, I'm saying something really complicated here. So if you are used to doing NumPy computations, then it just you just change uh, from NP to CP. Of course, you have to be on a GPU enabled system. Yes, we should consider uh, data transferring overhead. And in fact, we can put this, for example, here. It's one thing that I will mention after. So the data transfer is really, yeah, here the computation is quite expensive. So at least uh, uh, it, it can more or less uh, overcome the thing of the data transfer. So it's a, co a compute intensive operation. If I had two vector additions, I don't think so that it would be so uh, that 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 would be the case. In that case, uh, you would have uh, also uh, to to take into consideration a lot the, that, and you may have different completely different times. So here again, with uh, you see that including the the transfer of the arrays again, the computation uh, of uh, uh, with the GPU is faster, but it's something uh, that is uh, is really uh, on the pinnacle of uh, gpu computing that you have to take care of uh, as uh, in the best way possible the the transfer of uh, the transferring operations uh, from one uh, memory to the other because many times this is the limiting factor and not the actual computation that you are going to perform so uh, the good thing that Kupai has is that uh, it has these routines that you don't have to do, for example, NP random random at first and then move it. You can calculate directly. You can generate them directly on the GPU. I do that here to be consistent so that I, I make sure that I do completely the same operations. But uh, typically, I would use the Kupai random generator, not the NumPy one. So we have this that uh, Raphael has shown in a previous uh, in a previous lecture. We have this Euclidean distance matrix, and we have the vectorization friendly summation that uh, Raphael has shown. And I added here for uh, to benchmark it also with a GPU. So I have the Euclidean distance CPU, and it's completely the same on the GPU. The only thing that changes is that instead of NP sum, I use CP sum. So you see again that sum is supported also in the Coupa side, and also CP new axis, CP absolute value. It's they are supported directly on the GPU. So I will create again this random arrays here, and then I will perform the computations. 
And here I do the all close to make sure that uh, my arrays uh, are close that I am calculating the same thing. So you see that the elapsed time on the CPU was nine, 950 milliseconds. Again, this first time we should not take this into account. I will rerun this. And now this is the true time. So you see that it's at least 10 times faster. We can include also the transfer if, if you want. And you see that now that I included the transfer, we are no longer 10 times faster, but we are again faster than the CPU version. Also notice here that in order to perform a computation like NP or close, both of my arrays would need to be NumPy arrays. So the first array is a uh, Euclidean CPU is already an NumPy array, but in order to be able to make the comparison that they are close, I have to transfer back the GPU array on the, on the, on the main memory. I could use CP, CP all close, but then I will have to transfer uh, one of the arrays to the GPU. So uh, generally you cannot mix between CPU and GPU arrays in the same function. You have to make a transfer first. So let me see if there's any question. Any question? Question? No. But you see here that more or less this function and this one, this, uh, they are one, they are just copies of each other. Don't they look similar? The only thing that changes is this NP, which becomes CP here. So what I can do for this, uh, Kupai developers have taken this into account that probably you have many function, functions defined uh, already that uh, do some work for you on NumPy. So you don't have to go and just do a search and replace the NP and uh, with CP. You can make your function work with both Kupai and NumPy. The only thing that says this is this line here. So what is this line? Here, I get the array module that the, the X array, for example, belongs to. So I use this array mode in this, uh, in this situation here, instead of NP or CP, and I run it. So what's happening now? When I run this function with a CPU array, the array mode here would be NumPy. While when I run with a GPU array, the array mode here will be Kupai. So I can make, for example, I will put a print statement here just so that I can convince you. So at first you see it's the module is NumPy because I passed it the CPU array. In the second case, it's Kupai. So depending on the, on the type of the array that I'm going to use, uh, it selects the corresponding uh, function based on the module that the, array, the, that the array belongs to. So now we have uh, a generic Euclidean distance function that works both with NumPy and CPy uh, and Kupai. And this is, uh, uh, this is true because as I said in the beginning, most of the typical functions that you would use in NumPy computations uh, have the, equi the uh, equivalent one in, uh, in a Kupai sense. And the computation is uh, being performed on the, on the GPU. So is this clear enough?
root. So let's go and revisit the Julia sets that uh, I have shown you in the Siphon uh, uh, module. So here I, I have put, I have copied the function that we have used uh, with, uh, when we were using Cython, you see here that I use the P range also, and I put the compile flags and the link flags that we needed so that uh, I can compare with the corresponding uh, version that uh, performs on the GPU. So to make a fair comparison, I want to make the calculation uh, be performed on all the on all my cores because it would not be fair to just calculate without uh, multi core and then compare the GPU. So I will plot here again. You see the typical image. If you want, you can a little bit experiment with this C value here and see what different uh, values can. Uh, you see, it's very sensitive and based. On the on the complex number here, the values are comp the the pattern that you see is completely different. So it's a, a different Julia set. Now, what is characteristic of uh, and typical of uh, Julia set computation is that it is embarrassingly parallel. So every Every grid point that we want to calculate the color of the Julia set, uh, the color of our final image at this point, uh, the calculation for this point can be uh, performed independent of each other. So this kind of calculations is where the GPU shines. So the GPU can make this embarrassingly parallel calculation very efficiently. And let's see how we can do that. Also, you, you see here that I have a double for loop and I range, uh, I loop throughout uh, uh, all my grid points, the first, the columns and the rows, and then the actual computation that takes place is this one. The two for loops are just so that uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can go through all the, all the grid points. So CuPy offers what is called an element-wise kernel. So as Vasilis explained before, uh, ker the kernel is a, a kind of computation that you, you send to the GPU to be performed. And this computation is, is the same computation that is going to be performed either if you don't specify otherwise in all elements of some uh, matrices that you are going to pass to the kernel. So uh, while here I would have to do a double for loop to go through the elements, the situation in the GPU kernel is different. You use the, uh, the, the grid, the, uh, the block IDs and the thread IDs on, on, your, uh, thread, on your block and thread grids to be able to calculate the address of the element where the thread is going to do the computation for you. So here, this is how an element-wise kernel is defined in CuPy. So for CuPy, since it's aware of the matrices that I'm going to pass it, I don't have to make uh, the index calculation explicitly myself. CuPy is going to do it for me. So what I, I'm going to do is this thing. First of all, the element-wise kernel accepts two strings. The first string is uh, the arguments that the kernel accepts as input. So here it's my, uh, my matrix Y, my, mat my matrix X, my matrix Y, a, a, const a float value, a float sc scalar CX, a float scalar CY, the number of maximum iterations and the radi radius two. And it returns uh, what I call Julia here, and it's an integer, which is basically the, the, the corresponds to the number of iterations uh, where the, uh, the, the point has exploded 
and its magnitude went out of the radius that I have defined. So again, here, you see that they are the same arguments like the ones that I passed in Cython. The only difference is that uh, with with Kupai, I re the return value is uh, passed uh, explicitly as a different string. And now here, this is my actual computation. You see, I don't have to specify a double for loop. I just make my initializations here and the computation is only the while. So this syntax is a, a C type of syntax. It's more or less uh, C or C++. So this small computation has to be written uh, in a language that uh, CUDA C understands. And this is actually my computation here. And I named this kernel Julia kernel. Okay, so let me know if you have any question here because this is more complicated from the standard uh, functions that we have used. Okay, I see I, we don't have any questions. So let me do this. I run this, the, the Julia kernel. And then I do completely the same thing that I would do with uh, my, my Cython computation. I just replace GPU timer here, Kupai timer, and I call the Julia, uh, GPU, Julia kernel. Notice here that I want to take back from the GPU uh, the, the, the result in Julia set because I want to plot it. So because uh, the matplotlib libraries accept, expect NumPy arrays, I have to get it back from the GPU and Julia array is therefore taken with a get uh, method here once my result is back. So in this case, I also take into account the transfer to the, to the CPU when I measure. So you see here that I don't have to do NPM script since Kupai already has these, uh, these functions for me. And then I run the computation. Notice here that I didn't have to pass any extent here, any dimensions like I would use here to find the dimensions that I would look for. Kupai does that for me. So it knows because it's an element wise kernel that I want to perform the calculation that I told it in each uh, element of the matrix that I'm passing. So I don't have to specify the dimensions explicitly. It finds by itself. So this time uh, included also the compilation time. So let me run with this, so let, let us see what the difference is with the second version, 164. Until there are a couple of questions if you- Seconds. Let me move. Uh, Dale, yeah. <clears throat> there, is, there are a couple of questions okay. about you, what you've shown. Just repeat them live if you okay, can. Yeah. So why do we need to copy X and Y into X, uh, into little X and little Y here? Values are passed by reference. Okay. So in this case, I initialize with uh, my initial values of X and Y because this value here uh, is going to be uh, changed in all the iterations. So I don't want to... Uh, to change the values of the array that are passed. And it's not something that I use as is, it's something that is changed in every iteration. You see X and Y, and then I have to check on this X and Y, uh, whether I'm uh, outside of my radius or not. Okay, so if, if I don't do this, uh, basically the, the, the array that is passed in can change the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to be careful about this. Yeah, yeah. So, because the kernels are passed by reference, uh, 
it might have a problem. So I want okay. to make sure that it's, it's clear. And here I initialize also with zero. So it's typically what you would uh, do if you are writing C code. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and can you repeat what the input string int 32 Julia in the input of the element wise kernel again? Is this how you return an array? Yes, so the element wise kernel expects three or four arguments for me. The important ones are the first one, which is what uh, the function accepts as the kernel accepts as input. So it might not be clear here. There is a comma. And after that is the value that the element wise kernel returns. So in the Cython version, because I allocated the memory outside, I passed it as an argument here because of all the things that uh, we were telling with Cython and with memory allocation in general. So I handle the memory allocation here with NumPy and then the values are filled inside the Cython function. But in the element wise kernel, I don't need to do that be exactly because of this thing that I tell it what is expected to return. And I, I write here Julia equals a, a, an it. So I don't have to do a, 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 an explicit return here, but by the name that corresponds to the return value. Uh, the element wise kernel knows what the return uh, value is and what the, the, the name of the return value is. And it based, because it's in an element wise kernel, it finds also the, the final dimensions of this. So it, it realizes from, for, from this that uh, the dimensions must be the same as the dimensions of the X and Y array. There is, there is another one, and then we can move on, I guess. So what about arrays that are bigger than GPU memory? Is there any possibility of streaming values to GPU memory or is it embarrassingly parallel problems? So yes, in this case, uh, you will have either to, to break your array into chunks and then overlap uh, communication uh, with computation somehow. Kupai uh, has also uh, st uh, streams that it supports. I don't uh, want to go into detail uh, with in the streams here, but it supports uh, many lower level things. So element wise kernel is one of the uh, lower level things than the one than the ones that are like Mescrit, for example, that uh, you do like you do in NumPy. So you can you can work with uh, CUDA streams, CUDA events is here. It has all this stuff, and uh, they are available under CP CUDA. So when you go to the CUDA uh, sub module of CUDA, you will you will find all this uh, uh, additional stuff that you might expect uh, to see in uh, a typical CPU uh, a typical CUDA code. So you, you can access lower level stuff from CUDA as well. So yes, you, you can overlap this, uh, those. And also it supports pin memory, it supports all that. And they continuously add stuff. And I will add something more about it uh, before I close the, the session. So what about kernels that do not agree to this pattern, to this element wise pattern? So in that case, you have to specify a raw kernel, which, uh, which Kupai also uh, enables you to do. So instead of element wise kernel, I have a raw kernel here. And now you see that this is completely like you would write a kernel in C. If you are not familiar with CUDA C, then it's okay, but for those of you familiar with CUDA C, this is the how you would write it. So you see here that I cannot go with Kupai's uh, way from the element wise kernel for the dimensions and everything. I have to do the indexing myself here. So this is the Julia kernel written in a raw form. So in this case, 
I would have to call rock kernel and I would have to explicitly pass uh, the, the grid dimensions and the block dimensions. You see here that I have to calculate them based on the number of points, based on the number of threads that I want to, uh, of, of in the X axis, in the Y axis of each block on, uh, for CUDA. And when I call the rock kernel, the first argument, the first two arguments uh, correspond to the, to the dimension of the block grid and the, to the dimension of the grid of uh, for CUDA and then uh, the dimension of the block here. So this is, if you can do it with an element wise kernel, then it's fine, but not all computations of course can be uh, can, can be expressed as an element wise kernel. And then you would have to go to CUDA all the way. What you, uh, the win from this, the, what you uh, gain from this is that you have uh, what you could have in uh, raw CUDA, but then you have it inside your Python code and all the other uh, computations can be performed by CUPI. Any question? No. So let me show you something that I have added in, in this iteration of the course. So the last time we performed the course, uh, this feature was not available yet, but they have added it now. And it's called kernel fusion. So imagine that you want to calculate uh, this function, one over one plus uh, exponential of minus x. And this is the sigmoid function. And imagine that you want to perform uh, this function, to calculate this function for all the elements of an array. So the typical thing that you might do with uh, NumPy is of course, uh, the easiest one is to use CP directly. You see here, I use, like I would use with NumPy, this is vectorized, this is fine. I could use an element-wise kernel, which is more complicated. Or I could do this thing here, sigmoid fused, which is, looks the same as this, but it, it's not. So what the difference is, so this is the CPU, I perform it with NumPy, the kernel version, the fused and the GPU. Let me run. And I'm running here. So this is how the function looks like. I wanted to include here just so that you have an idea. So the elapsed time for uh, the CPU was 96. Uh, milliseconds. The elapsed time for uh, the GPU was, for this calculation here, was 54. For the kernel, the element-wise kernel was 14, and for uh, the fuse was 24. Just to make sure that I'm doing the correct things, I will do it. So again, the first is the CPU version, 96 milliseconds. The second one is the version where I use the CUPI X minus X without the fuse. The third version is the element wise. And the fourth version is the fused one. So basically what the difference is between the simple uh, version here, which just uses CUPI operation and the fused here, is that CUPI went and transformed this into an actual kernel. So you don't have, again, the overhead of all these things that uh, uh, CUPI does when you're calculating. 
So your computation is more or less on par with what you would define by yourself as an element-wise kernel. You see here, it's four times faster than the actual computation that is performed. So it it's uh, it transforms this to a kernel for you. It can do it for simple computation. Don't expect it to have a very complicated function and uh, just use Kupai Fusion uh, expected to do this for you. So, so instead of going and writing this, you can just use fuse for this simple function that is uh, element by element and Kupai will create a better version uh, for you than what you would use here. So if you, if you are planning to do the computation once, okay, it's okay not to fuse, but if you are using this calculation many, many times, a lot of times iteratively, then you will gain a lot by this. So this is the small function again. And any questions? Let me see the time, we have 10 minutes more. Okay. So one thing that I want to talk about here, so from here we can do NVIDIA SMI and see everything. So this is before we had this beautiful thing here to show us the memory and everything. Oh, let me add it here. So I do host and the array to see uh, the memory that is occupied by my arrays. You see here that I have many arrays that occupy memory, also on the GPU, the ones denoted with GPU here. X, Z CPU, Z CPU. So one thing that Kupai does for you, if you don't specify otherwise, it is that it uses on, uh, on the background a memory pool. So in general, when you do a, a memory allocation on the GPU, uh, a memory is allocated the first time, but even when this uh, array is deleted, uh, Kupai has a memory pool and keeps this memory allocated for you because it assumes that some, some, at some point in the future, you are going to need again the same uh, amount of memory or a similar amount of memory. And then instead of just allocate, of going and allocate from the beginning, it has already allocated this memory for you on the GPU, and then it, it will just fill it with uh, the numbers. So you, uh, you don't have to pay the allocation uh, overhead again the, the next time you allocate. So to show you how this looks like, memory pool uses 1.9 gigabytes out of 3 gigabytes. So the memory pool is three gigabytes, but the actual memory that has useful stuff in it is 1.9. This is because we made some allocations before, it deallocated the memory, it deleted some arrays, but the memory still remains like that. If you want to free the blocks that the memory pool keeps for you, but this will not free the useful stuff, then you can do free all blocks. Now, if I do that, it will say one, nine, two, six out of this, and it keeps some memory also uh, occupied. So let me do, for example, delete the ZGPU. and do that. You see, now I have less elements. Let me delete one bigger, like the XGPU, for example. Yeah, delete XGPU, delete YGPU, and let me do this again. You see now my useful data is 1.6 gigabytes out of 2.3. I can do free and 
sometimes you will see here that nothing really happens. And this uh, is true because the array might not have been garbage collected again. This happens in the Jupyter notebook because we go cell by cell. Uh, typically, uh, in a standard Python program, the garbage co collector at some point will collect the memory, but we can enforce it. Let me do this. And okay. Now um, oh, this is duplicated, but yeah. So yeah, the, it has some overhead because of other stuff that it has allocated it uses in the kernels and everything and the CUDA context, uh, but you get the idea. If you want to completely disable the memory pool, you can, when you start your computations, So you see here, now we are zero. And let me allocate one zero array quite big. You see, we are occupying memory now and let me delete it, directly deleted it. Otherwise, if I, did, I, if I had the allocator enabled, let me restart the kernel. I allocate here, I delete, but the memory pool still keeps the memory allocated. So it's up to you to, uh, if you know what you are doing, you can disable it or, uh, and there is also the pinned allocator that uh, it uses. So set pinned memory allocator. So you can control also pinned memory allocation. Uh, okay. So with this, uh, I have finished what I wanted to just in time. Uh, we, are, we have three minutes for questions. So yeah, ah, let, let us see also uh, some typical, let me run. so that we see that indeed we are using the GPU. So there is computations taking place. So you see the, the memory, it always increases because my allocator is enabled. Let me disable it and you will see the difference. Let me set it to none, kernel, restart kernel, and run all cells. Okay, so now, you see that there are the allocations in between when the memory is not needed anymore. It finished. So, any questions? So, just to close this, uh, I think that for those of you who are using NumPy, then give it a shot and uh, try Kupai because you might get performance gains for your computations just by 
uh, doing this simple move to uh, the computational demanding of the computational demanding parts of your code to the GPU. So, one minute for questions. Otherwise, uh, you can uh, have your questions uh, answered and other questions as well for uh, number GPU and or from something that we did the previous days. And I, I would be glad me and my colleagues to answer. Okay, I will stop sharing now. Okay, everyone, we'll take a, a quarter of an hour break and we'll be back at 2.15 with uh, MPI for Pi and IPI Parallel. So go and grab yourself a coffee or something to eat and see you in 15 minutes.
Okay, it's quarter past, so hopefully everyone's back from the break. I'm just going to share my screen. And hopefully everyone can see the notebook. Um, just give me a, a quick uh, show of hands. The participant list, wonderful. So yeah, welcome everyone to the last session of, I guess, formal material. Um, everything we've done, or more or less everything we've done so far has been single node, um, but it could be the case, of course, that you're um, your workload is not, it's not suitable for a single computer. Maybe it takes too long, or for example, you have a data set which is too large and it can't fit in memory. And of course, single cores um, have kind of stopped getting faster in the last few years. Everyone talks about uh, Moore's law and Denard scaling ending. So instead of, you know, um, every year having faster and faster cores. Uh, we basically reached the limit of that. And so now we have multi-core processors and also you really need to go to parallel uh, distributed computing if you want to scale any further. So um, there are various, I guess, approaches to parallelization. Um, we're gonna focus on something called a message passing. Um, it's kind of an industry standard for programming of distributed memory computers, at least uh, when you're using C or C++ or Fortran. Uh, so if you are familiar with using MPI, um, with those languages, then uh, it should be pretty trivial to pick it up for Python, because in a lot of ways it's a little bit easier with Python. Um, with Python, there's a module that we can import called MPI for Pi. What is message passing? Um, so imagine you've got a distributed memory computer. It's got multiple serial computers. Um, these are not sharing memory. So they have distinct memory spaces. Um, and if they need to commu uh, communicate with each other, they have to do that via some kind of network. Um, every time that data is passed between these processors, um, you need to pass messages. So you, you'll be passing data around, for example. Um, this is, of course, in contrast to shared memory process, where you have multiple cores um, that are running threads, and those threads can all read the same region of memory. Um, so you don't need to worry about explicitly moving data around. What is um, MPI? Well, um, stands for Message Passing Interface. Um, it's not new. It's been around since, I guess, the 1990s. It's language independent, communications protocol, and it's portable. So platform independent, and it's kind of a de facto standard for parallel computing on distributed memory systems. Jordan raised the hand. Is there a question or? Uh, no, no, sorry, I clicked wrong. No problem. Um, so let's, let's ask, let's do a quick poll. Um, who's used MPI on, uh, with Fortran or C? Let me see if I can find the participants list. Okay. So not seeing a huge number of hands, um, who maybe it could be that people are asleep. So I'll ask the opposite question. Um, I'll lower everyone's hands and I'll say, who has never used MPI? Yeah, okay, it's loads of people. So the majority have not used it. Okay, great. So um, it's a standard. Um, so you mentioned various implementations exist. Some of the more famous ones um, are Open MPI, MPI CH from Argon, um, MVAPICH from the Ohio uh, State University, Intel MPI. So Intel has their own implementation as well. And on Pitts Daint, we have um, something, uh, a vendor, uh, Cray is the vendor and Cray has their own implementation, which is based 
kind of on MPICH um, with a little bit of extra magic for their specific interconnect, which is the Aries based interconnect. Um, it's a collection of functions and macros. It's, it's, it's basically a library and you can use it to parallelize C, Fortran, and of course, Python. I think there's also bindings exist for some other languages like R if you're doing statistics, but I haven't used those personally. Uh, for, up, for our intents and purpose, um, we're gonna be using MPI for Pi. And as I say, it's a, it's a module. So how do MPI programs work? Well, a lot of people use this um, SPMD model. So single program, multiple data. You basically write your program and then you run a copy of that program on every single process or, or core um, on your computer. So because you're um, running the same program on every single process, then obviously you need to do something to gain from the parallelization. You need to, for example, tell some processes that they should work on this particular data, another one should work on this data. And there needs to be some logic, you know, for in there to tell what process should do what, okay? And of course, there has to be some way to, for them to communicate with each other. Um, so this is this idea of message passing, sending explicit messages between processes um, to, to move around data and that sort of thing. Um, the good news uh, with MPI for Pi is it's kind of a lot easier than it is in the C and Fortran versions. Um, so it seems like not many of you have used MPI before, but if you were to, for example, written uh, Fortran code in MPI, you'll find that you need to, um, that every function takes a lot of arguments and you need to explicitly enter all of these arguments. You, and, you know, there's, there's so many of them that you kind of have to have the, a copy of the standards sitting next to you um, until you become quite familiar with MPI because you'll forget the order of the arguments and, and so many of them. So for example, you want to send um, just one, some data from one process to another. You need to send, well, the name of the data buffer that you're sending, uh, the number of elements that you're going to send of that data, the data type of those elements, um, some kind of unique tag so that you know when you send the data and it's received that there's going to be a matching tag, uh, the name of the communicator, which is the, the set of processes that are, that are involved in the communication, and also some error status. Uh, so there's yeah, lots of different things to remember, but with Python, you can actually get away with just um, default values for many of these things. So with Python, to send something, uh, a Python object from one process to other, maybe you can just send the name of that object and where you want to send it. And you might be able to get away with simply that. In Python, you can send arbitrary objects. Um, so you can send things like dictionaries and they are converted uh, into byte streams, they're sent. And then once they're received, they're, they're converted back into the Python objects. And then for more performance, you can send uh, some objects directly without having to do this conversion um, to byte streams. And so you can do that for things like NumPy arrays. It's for, it's for buff, buffer type objects. Um, and this communication is much faster. And we'll see an example of this later on. So what does a, a code look like? So here's a hello world. Um, what we're going to do here is we're just going to write this file. What we do is we import uh, MPI from the MPI for Pi module. And then we set up um, this communicator. So as I say, a communicator is basically a group of processes that are going to be able to communicate with each other. And when you set up MPI, there are some default communicators. And one of them is called MPI com world. And that basically just contains all the processes that are in your world. So when you launch your MPI job, um, you will pass it as one of the arguments to the run command, the number of processes you want to run on. And then MPI com world will consist of all those processes. Okay. So what we, we do is we create our communicator, we call it com, and then we can um, run a couple of methods on that. One of them is get size, and that will just return the number, total number of processes that we have. And then we also, we can run the, the get rank method. And for each process that's in our com world, each rank will get a unique identifier. And that, that will be from um, zero through to the number of processes that we have minus one. 
So if we simply uh, create that file, you can see that I should point out um, if you don't have 00, zero MPI for Pi, IPI parallel notebook, um, then please do a git pull. Um, and then it should be available for you in the directory ipi parallel underscore mpi4. So as I say, the communicator is a group of processes that talk to each other, um, and then each one gets a unique rank. How do we execute the code? So um, we can't run these at the moment just directly in the notebook. Uh, we need to run through an external uh, MPI launcher. So Typically people use um, commands like MPI run or MPI exec um, to launch MPI code. Uh, on pits date, we launched them with S run. So it's a, it's a Cray specific um, Slurm native MPI launcher. So on other, other machines that you probably have access to, you might need to use something like MPI run or MPI exec. The standard, the MPI standard doesn't actually say anything about how MPI programs should be launched. So um, it will it will depend on the implementation. On Pitstain, we, we launched with SRUN. So and we'll do SRUN dash N8, and that will tell us that we want to run eight processes. And then we can see the results. Uh, what you will see immediately is that um, the different processes have not um, output their um, this, the standard out in order, it's, it's a random order, it's whoever finished first. And this is something that you need to be um, kind of aware with when you're doing parallel program with MPI, that you can't be sure who's going to complete um, in what order. So if I ran this again, last time we had 6725, we'll probably see something else. Uh, yeah, we have 0, 3, 4, 5. Um, so it could be random every time. In the code that we had above here, you can see that it was not really very exciting because um, nothing was sent between any processes, no work was done, it was just hello world. What we typically need to do is uh, what's known as point to point communication, uh, which is basically sending messages, i.e. data from one proce process to another. Um, and for point to point communication between uh, generic Python objects, uh, we see that MPI for Pi provide send and receive methods. Um, and they're pretty similar to um, what you will find in, in other MPI, in the MPI standard, so for, for C and Fortran. Um, so once again, the processes that MPI creates, they all have their own individual distinct memory space. So they can't access each other's data directly. You have to tell them that they need to send some data to their friend and their friend needs to make a call to receive that data. And so what we do is we call com.send and we pass an object and we pass a destination and optionally we pass a, a unique tag. And so here, the, the rank zero will be sending to the destination rank one some data. In this case, it's a very small dictionary. And then at the other side, rank one has to call com.receive. And it says that instead of a destination, it wants a source. So it says that I'm going to be expecting this message from rank zero and then the tag and the tag must match. If you leave out the tag, then it will still work um, in this example because it will assume um, any tag. So it will allow any message um, if, if, there's, if you have not specified the tags, but if you specify the tag, then it will um, be specific for this message. And it's likely that you'll be sending a whole lot of messages around the system. So it's best to, to give them a tag. What we can do is we can create the file and I can run. And what are we doing? We're simply outputting that 
Um, so rank zero is the outputting that it sent some data called rank, uh, sorry, uh, sending the data, data to rank. And likewise, the other process received this, this data from it. So a little exercise for just three minutes or so. What we could do is we can um, generalize this example uh, so that the dictionary, this, this little dictionary of uh, an integer and a float is sent to an arbitrary number of processes. Because at the moment, if we don't have um, two ranks, it's, um, it's, not, it's gonna fail. Well, it's not, it's not generalizable to more than two ranks. So what we really want to do is we want to send this dictionary to all of the different processes in our system. So we can run with, for example, uh, srun-en12, and we want rank zero to send that dictionary to all of the other ranks. Okay, so I'll just give you two minutes to, to work on that, and then we'll have a look at the solution and continue. It's a couple of hints. Um, we could do, so I want you to use put this, this, the same point to point communication, obviously. And so what you'll probably, what to do is a, a for loop for the send. And then because you want to have unique tags for each of the sending, you could use, you could actually use the, the rank of the process as its tag, which will guarantee that you will have matching sends and receives. Now, what could happen is if you try to run your code with something like the below after you've written it, after you've written some code, and the thing never returns. And so if anyone has found that, then what's probably happened is that you had a send, but you didn't have a matching receive. And so the communication has never received has never completed and therefore you're in a deadlock and your code will just keep spinning and never actually return. And if that's the case, the cell will continue to be active, but you won't be able to easily control C out of it. So what I suggest you do in that case is let's open up a terminal And what you could do is um, there'll be some processes, um, srun processes, probably you can find them gripping, uh, doing a grep for srun. And you'll see that there's a, an srun hanging. What you could do is you could simply kill all srun. And then um, you'll find that your notebook cell will return and you can tidy up your code and hopefully it will be working next time. So did anyone manage to get it, the thing to work? Uh, hands up. One, two, couple. Okay. So yeah, okay, more and more, more and more are working. All right, so let's have a look at a, a little sample solution. So what we do again, we, we of course do our standard setup. Another thing to note actually is the standard setup is a lot easier than it is in um, C and Fortran as well. So in, in those languages, you need to initialize MPI and you also need to finalize MPI at the end. In Python, you can get away with not doing a lot of this stuff. So all we need to do is import the module, set out our communicator, Make sure that each of the ranks knows their own unique ID and that you, we all know what the size of the communicator is. And then you can just do a loop. Um, so if the, the rank zero, they, they assign the, this dictionary to data and then they say for, 
for a loop um, up to the size of our of, of all of the processes. Uh, we send the data to the destination I with the tag I, and then we print else um, the other processes. So all of them except for rank zero. They do a com dot receive from source of zero, and they use again. This probably should be. I uh, know oh that's probably right. So let's see if it runs. Let's write it. Let's run it. And you can see, yeah, process zero has sent our dictionary to all of them. All of the other processes have received. So point to point communication is blocking. So um, what does that mean? It basically means that um, when you have done, when you have called com.send, um, com.send will only return when it is safe to reuse that buffer. So IE, it means that the communication has either completed or this data buffer has been stored somewhere else and it's um, ready to be received when the com.receive is, is posted. Otherwise, it will just block. So you know that when it continues, it's safe to do so. Otherwise, it block. So yeah, this is what I mentioned. If you never called the receive, this will never progress beyond this line. So it's what we know. This is what we know as uh, deadlocking in the MPI code. So typically, you need to make sure that you your receivers post their receives. Um, if they don't, then you, there's potential for deadlock in your program. The other type of communication is non-blocking. So we also have non-blocking point to point. Um, and this is where we can potentially get a little bit of performance. So as I mentioned, you, with blocking communication, potentially this com.send is gonna wait uh, until the receiver is posted. If you're sending a large amount of data and it can't be buffered anywhere, then it will just wait uh, for the receive. But we can also use non-blocking um, communication. And for this, we use the I send and I receive. And what happens here is when you issue the I send and I receive, they will immediately return and you'll get a request object. And then what you need to do um, is that you call the uh, wait method and then you'll know that the communication has been completed. So the idea there is you can overlap um, the communication with some other computation. And this could potentially give you a bit of speed up because communication is slow compared to computation in general. So here we have an example of basically the same thing that we've done, but this time we're using non-blocking communication uh, and non-blocking communication you should try to use whenever you can. So what we do is um, we call com.isend basically the same arguments that we had last time, but then we call a wait. And once that wait returns, we know that the communication is finished. So the idea is most likely you'll do some, some work here um, that doesn't require uh, the reuse of this data buffer. So you'll do some other work while this is communicating and then it will return, then you call the, the rec.wait and then you'll know that it's safe to be able to continue. On the other side, all of the other processes do a com.i receive and they also call the wait. And then we know that the communication has been completed. So we can just create that. We can run it again. We'll run it on eight processes.
and you can see that the again the communication has completed. Typically, as I say, try to use the non-blocking communication if you can. Now, next topic, collective communication. So what we've seen so far is point-to-point -point communication. You basically have one rank and it sends some data to another rank. And what we did in order for that process zero to be able to send it to all of the different processes, we simply did a loop and we told it to one by one send that data to all of them. And I think you can probably imagine that's not necessarily uh, the most optimal way of doing such communication. And for that reason, we have collective communication. And basically what we've just seen is known as a broadcast. You have one process, has got some data, you wanna send it to all of the other processes. You could do that with a series of MPI send and receive, which we did, but you can also do it with this collective operation called broadcast. There are a number of advantages. So first of all, um, you're gonna have less lines of code because you don't need to have that loop and you don't need to have the if. Um, the reason for that is that all of the processes, not just the one that's sending it, but all of them actually make the same call. They all make the same call to broadcast. You can see that in the code sample down here. So in one line, we've basically encapsulated everything that we needed, the loop and the, the if before. So you can see that in the arguments to the broadcast, we say, where is the data coming from? We call that the root process. Often it will be process zero um, just for um, convenience sake, but there's nothing to actually say that it has to be. That's why you need to specify it. And then you can say the data that you're sending. And so you can see this is not an if, so all of the processes, including process zero, are all making exactly the same call. But because we designate the route, we know which one is sending it, and all of them are sent, all of them are receiving it. And you can see in this little schematic diagram above that the, the process zero is also sending it to itself. And that's not so significant for the broadcast, but it is significant for other collective operations. But we don't also, we don't only have the advantage that you've got less lines of code. We've also got the advantage that um, performance is potentially gonna be a lot better. Um, you're, it's now up to the implementation to be able to do a very smart broadcast. And so imagine you have a lot of processes then it could use some kind of tree-like tree structure or something like that to be able to efficiently send this data to all of the processes. Not so much of a problem as there's four processes, but if there's 4,000, then you can use um, some advantages of whatever underlying network you have or some um, tree-like structures to be able to send those in, in much less time than you would otherwise. Let's run the code, check that it works. Um, yep, so we should see that the results are exactly the same um, as we had before. Uh, it was a successful uh, completion of our broadcast. So there are a number of different um, MPI collectives. Another one is called the scatter. And so with broadcast, we just sent the same data to everyone. With scatter, um, what you're doing is you're splitting the data into chunks and then you're sending um, a chunk of those to each of the processors to work on. So here you can immediately see that you're probably going to do, be, be gaining something from the parallelization. You send a bit of a chunk of data to each one to do or a task to each, each one to do and then they will go about working on their own chunk of data. So here's our example. Um, again, we've got rank zero sending, the, uh, scattering the data. And so here you can see what I mentioned before. Um, it also scatters a piece to itself. And it, so it will also work on its own, its own piece as well. What are we doing here? We are adding one to our rank and then squaring it. Um, so, uh, we're going to be sending 
the values 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on. And again, we call com.scatter. And we say that we're sending this data. This is the buffer that's going to be split up, sent to all the different processes, and it's root that's going to be sending it. So we can run the code. And so we printed that each process received a certain piece of data. And then we also did an, an assert um, that, that that data value actually is equal to its own rank squared, um, its own rank plus one rather than squared. And so you can see again that that's the case. We can run it on 12 and you can see that it's still working. Uh, if anyone has tried running on larger number of processes, any of these examples, but if I try to run on 124, for example, we'll see that we get an error. And more processes requested than permitted and someone can probably answer in the in the Q&A, um, what the maximum number of processes we can use on one node of Pitts Daint. This is a good test to see if you're actually doing the exercises as well. Sixteen. So sixteen is a surprising answer for me because I would expect twenty-four. Um, but but your mileage may vary. So yeah, I think it should be twenty-four because there are twelve real cores and and twelve virtual cores on the node type that we're using. Um, on pit stain, it's a, it's a 12 core as well, so 24 virtual cores in total. The next up, we have um, the gather, which is as basically just the inverse of the scatter. So here we have, we've probably scattered our data arrays across different processes, and we've done some work on them, and now we want to gather them back to the root process. And this is known as the gather method that we call on the communicator. So let's write the file again um, and write it. So we'll run it with four processes. It didn't output any result this time because we don't have a print statement in there. But what we did was we, had, we do have an assert. And so we assert that the data in position i is equal again to the square of what we're receiving. Now, what happens if we try to, um, if we, for example, say, instead of rank zero telling us what the result is, why don't we say, what happens if we make rank one tell us what the result is? Uh-oh. So you can immediately say, see that the assert um, has failed. And the reason for that is that the, the gather method only returns the results on that root process. Not on all of them. And that's why we need to designate in the gather, uh, which would be the one that we're going to be then probably outputting some result or doing some other work. And I mean, you can imagine it might not be the smartest thing to send the results to all of the processes because maybe if it's a solution, then you don't need it on all of the processes. You just need it on one of them to tell you the answer. However, we do have other methods like all reduce, which will do, uh, so all gather, sorry, um, which will gather not only onto the root process, but it will gather the results onto all of the processes. If we want to do that, we can actually we can try that. We can put all gather in there. And we can try to run that. And we'll see that that fails as well because we haven't put the right arguments to all gather. So 
it makes sense that all gather is not going to, you're not going to ex, um, explicitly say which process to gather them on because all gather will gather them onto all processes. So we don't need that argument and then we'll run it. And the assert is going to fail here because it's no longer none on all of them. So Okay, comment that and then it will should, I think, run hopefully. Yeah. So now you can see I can make that which one we want. And it will always work because no matter which rank we say we want to do something, we don't even need the if statement, but just for convenience sake, you can see that the result is clearly on every single process, not just on the root process now. Okay, now we can get even cooler and smarter. Um, imagine we want to gather our results and then we also want to do some kind of arithmetic on them. So these operations are known as reduction operations. And there are some, a few different varieties. There's a, a sum, so this is the default reduction operation, MPI sum, and that will sum the elements from the different processes. And we've also got a product, so we can multiply the elements together. There's a max, there's a min, there's a few others um, that are available in the spec, so you can check them out. Let's take a look at one example. Here we're doing something quite similar. We're creating a, a small, very small NumPy array just of the rank of the process. And then we're going to do the reduce and we're going to calculate the sum of all of the results and we're going to also calculate the maximum value of all the results. So let's write the file and let's say we'll run it on all presses. Okay. So does this look right? Um, the maximum value is going to be three. So remember, we're, we're going to be sending out zero, one, two, and three because we asked for four processes. So that seems reasonable that the maximum is going to be three and a three plus two is five plus one is six. So the sum is also working. Once again, we've used reduce. Um, so that means that we need to tell it uh, what process will get the, the final answer. And it can save us a lot of time that we don't send the answer to all of the processes. I um, mean, we don't really need it there, but we could equally call all reduce and the all reduce will um, return the result on all processes. And so again, then you would drop the, the argument about where to, to find the solution. Let's try it with a larger number. So eight, first person in the chat to be able to tell me what the result's going to be before I run it. You'll win a chocolate fish or something like that. The value for the sum. People are too shy, they don't want to get it, get it wrong. So 28, okay. Now, what 28, great. Thanks, Louise. So those of you with very good eyesight might have seen something interesting in the last example. Here we have um, the capitalization of reduce. So like the rest of Python, capitalization is important, unlike something like Fortran. So you might be asking, why is it reduce with a capital and not with a small? Thank you for asking. That's a very good question. So in Python, we have two different versions of pretty much all of the MPI methods. We have the lowercase version that we've seen for the first set of examples, and then we've got this uppercase version. And with the, with the lowercase, you can send pretty much any arbitrary object. And what MPI for Pi will do will be serialize it, send it, and then deserialize it. Um, 
This process is known as pickling and unpickling. And what it will do is it will slow your code down. If you have things like a NumPy objects, then you can use these uppercase versions, which are faster. And there you're basically just sending a contiguous memory space. So it doesn't need to do this pickling and unpickling um, at, e at both ends. So save some time, same, saves some space potentially as well. And it will be much more performant. However, there is something to note, and that is that you need to, um, the calls are slightly different. The memory of the receiving buffer actually needs to be allocated prior to the communication. And also, as I mentioned, it has to be contiguous memory that you're sending. So things like strings or uh, NumPy arrays will be fine, but other objects won't work. Um, you can look up um, pickling and unpickling in, uh, in Python to, to have an idea of which things are gonna work. So here's our example. Um, and you can see, as I mentioned, at the receive end, there's a slightly different, um, different call. So you need to create that data object beforehand. And then instead of data equals com.receive, data then becomes the first argument of that capital receive. It's just, a, it's just a minor variation. It's not a big change, but it's important to note. So now we run it and you'll see that we've sent this uh, small NumPy array um, and each of the processes have received it. It's a, it's a send and receive. They've all sent, sent some data and they've all received the same data. And you will hopefully have seen that it was extremely fast. So you just have to take my word for that. In summary, it's interesting to note, I kind of thought perhaps before the, the course that most of you would be familiar with MPI, but you're not. So this is a good introduction. Um, as I say, it's pretty, it's pretty simple with Python, simpler than with other languages actually. Um, what we need to do is import this MPI for Pi. Um, the calls are via the communicator objects, so com dot, and then you can run methods once you've got your uh, MPI com world. You can communicate arbitrary things. And in, in C and Fortran, you need to be very specific about the data types that you're sending. You can use direct derived data types, but you really need to be explicit. You tell them, I'm sending three floats followed by four integers or something like that which is kind of tedious, but, um, but we saw in our examples that you can just send a, a Python dictionary with a, I think it was a float and an integer just without too much hassle. And important to note for performance reasons, and of course, this is a performance, high performance computing course, send your NumPy arrays with these uppercase versions. Now, As I mentioned, we're not running these MPI code directly in our notebook. We're having to make an external call because of this issue about having to launch it with the MPI run, or in our case, S run. So what S run does is it sets up the MPI um, communication and sets the number of processes that you're running. If we were to try to do this in our notebook, how would the notebook know um, how many processes we want to use. And also we need to launch with an MPI aware uh, launcher. So there are these kind of tricky things that we need to think about, but it can be solved and it's solved through something called IPython parallel. Quick hands up, anyone used IPython parallel? Again, I don't see any hands. So IPython parallel is a, is a generic way of doing parallel computing. It, do, it doesn't only work with MPI. It has its own um, 
uh, way to do any kind of generic communication um, across distributed memory and shared memory computers. So I would thoroughly encourage you to have a look at the spec. The basic idea is that you imagine that we're in our notebook cell. We have an IPython process running in the background, which is um, every time we issue a, a code cell here, it's making a call externally to IPython. Um, so already there's kind of communication involved, right? Um, we are using a client in the front end and we're telling a back end process to do something and then it will return us something back in our browser. So there's already communication. There's already um, potential to be able to do parallel computing because instead of just having one IPython process running, why don't we just have loads of them running in the background? And this is what are known as IPython parallel engines or IPy parallel engines. Basically every engine is like a process. And so you consider it similar to when we were doing MPI processes, um, each of them could be running a copy of our program. And then you need something to be able to schedule the communication between them and to be able to return results back to, to, to our browser. And so there are two kind of parts to it. There's the controller, which is consisting of this hub and schedulers, and they're sending the work um, to the engines and receiving responses back and basically scheduling all of the work for us, all the tasks. And then there's the engines. So we have a controller and a series of engines. And how do we get them started? There are a few different ways you can do it. Uh, three of them are mentioned here. So one of them is to start the, the controller and then you start one or more engines and you tell them to refer back to that controller. So the controller process will start and then you tell the engines, I want you to point back to that um, process ID of the controller and then the controller will know that certain uh, processes have started, the engines that are gonna be doing the work and everything can, can then start. There's a command that does both the starting of the controller and the engines at once and that's called IP cluster. And then there's other ways that you can do it. For example, um, our colleague Raphael has created uh, a custom magic and you can start from a notebook cell by importing IPC magic. Um, you can automatically do the equivalent of the IP cluster command. What we're going to do is the, the first version because although it's the most labor intensive, um, it gives you a better idea of what's actually happening because you need to be more explicit about what you're doing. So what we're gonna do is we need to pull up a terminal. So go to file new terminal and then drag it across the screen so that we've got a terminal and our notebook side by side. And so we can have a kind of an idea of what's going on. Hands up if everyone's got the, the terminal running. Awesome. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna type IP controller start. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run it in the background. So we don't need to bring up yet another terminal. So issue that, you can see um, it will start to produce some output to the screen. And because we're running it in the background, our cursor is returned. And hopefully you'll see something like connected or um, an idea that something's actually happening. Um, and if you were to look at top or PS or something, you'll probably find your um, IP controller processes running. And then the second part that we need to do is to run the engine, start the engines. So we can do that by S run dash n and then a certain number of processes. Engine. 
And then dash dash MPI, tell it that we want to um, establish our MPI communicator. And you can see that we're running this with S run. And this is very important. Because likewise, the, the problem that we had with our um, with, with running MPI within our notebook, we needed to be able to start these with S run. So it sets up about up our MPI for us. So we run it. Probably some of you have already run it. Let me make this terminal a little bit wider so you can see what's happening. Okay, so immediately we can see some interesting stuff. So each of these engines is going to output some information. And you can see that it's already done a from MPI for PI import MPI. And that's because we passed it that MPI flag. And it's um, called MPI.com world get rank method. Um, it's called the get size method. And then you can see that the engines um, also output some information about that they've registered. So um, each of them are getting a unique ID. So zero, one, two, and three in my case. Uh, you might have started more or less uh, engines than that. And also the, the IP controller is telling us that, oh, it's noticed that some engines have, um, it's, it's, it's been running in the background and it's saying, oh, some engines have started and it has connected to them and it's registered them. So now we have four engines that are registered as zero, one, two, and three. Let me move a little bit of real estate across here. And we can now import IPI parallel. Again, make sure that you've got the Miniconda Python HPC kernel running. And then we can start um, a remote client and connect to it. And so then if we pass the IDs to our remote client, we can see that there are four, zero, one, two, and three, as we kind of expected. So those are those IDs that they've registered with. So very similar to, to when we were running MPI, they all got IDs of zero, one, and then up to the number of processes that we had, minus one, and a similar sort of things happen here. Now, the beauty of this is that the IP controller is constantly looking at what engines are available for it. So if I control C out of it and I kill those engines, then you can see the IP controller says, oh, heartbeat, missed. Um, so now it's getting a little bit stressed that it cannot connect to the engines. It thinks the engines might have died, which they have because I killed them. And we can see that we still have four um, engines at the moment. However, at some point, we'll see that it will give up on trying to connect to them. And here we can see registration unregistered engine. And then you can see that no longer um, does, the, does our client have any engines to be able to use. So in this way, you could actually conceive that you could start or stop um, and add engines as you liked, which is quite, e quite a nice thing to be able to do potentially um, because with MPI in general, um, usually you say, I want a certain number of processes and then the whole application just runs with those from start to finish. With this, we could add or remove engines and also um, I imagine you have a lot of nodes that are running your job. One of the nodes dies. The controller will see that that has died and then it will try to recover by sending um, data to other, other workers to be able to complete the operation. So let's start, because I killed them all, let's start again. Um, this time I'll start eight of them. And you'll see as the IDs appear, we've got from zero to seven. Now, what do we actually, how do we actually run our MPI code? Because we still haven't got quite that far yet. The IPI parallel provides some beautiful magic commands. So we've got the percentage sign PX and two percentage signs PX uh, for the cell magic. And so if we want to run something on all of the engines, then we go cell magic px and then you can execute the code. 
And all we're doing here is we're just printing the, the process ID of, um, of that particular process and the host name where it's running. And you'll see that because we're, we've started everything on the same node, not, it's not surprising they all have the same NID. But in a real world application, these could be running on completely different machines. And then you see each of them has a process ID. So that's very cool. Um, I mean, we can pass um, some arguments to the magics. So for example, uh, we only want the first couple to do something. Well, actually for that zero to um, one, but not including the last one. So if we want the first two to do it, then it's zero and one. And then finally, we get to our full application. What we need to do is we need to import MPI from MPI for Pi. We import NumPy. And basically everything in this cell, because it's in a PX parallel magic cell, everything is going to be done by every engine. And so they will then be able to do MPI. And we can try it out. So once again, you can see that we're not having to make that external call to S run uh, because our engines are ready. And what we do is we call, we have, we can paste our MPI code directly into the cell and we can just run it with this magic. Here again, I think what we're doing is we're creating a small NumPy array. It's slightly different. Um, this time we have um, the size by size. Um, array, and then what we do is we send one row to each process. Drag that out a little bit. So let's do it with, with four processes, just so that it's a little bit tidier on the screen. Registering the engines. Okay, so we've got a four by four matrix, and what we're doing is a scatter and again we're using the uppercase version so for performance reasons and what we're going to send is one row to each of the processes including the process zero so you can see the first row of our matrix is received successfully by process zero the second row by process one the third row by process two and finally the, the last process receives the last row of the matrix. And there we have it. So do we have any questions? Sounds like it's pretty clear. Um, as I say, it's the example we've shown, we've just been using one, pro, one, uh, one node, but there's absolutely nothing to stop you from using multiple. Okay, we have a question. Is there a difference between MPI and multiprocessing? Yes, so um, that's something that we haven't covered in this course is that there's a, a multiprocessing module available. In, in Python and it's a similar, but, um, but MPI is, um, 
is potentially more performant because um, in HPC environments, I guess a lot of time and effort is put into optimizing MPI operations. So I would encourage you, certainly if you have MPI code already written in C or Fortran and you want to convert it to Python, then you may as well use the MPI interface, uh, but you can equally use multiprocessing if you um, to do that. So we have uh, 45 minutes um, to go and we can use that for generic questions. What I'll ask is that, that Theo and, and Raphael um, come online and we can, we can answer questions in general. I think in the, in the previous um, section from Theo, there was a question about uh, whether you could, oh, what, what, what happens if you have a CuPy array which is too big to fit into memory? And I mean, we know that GPU memory is often smaller than, than, than what you'll have on your CPU. On Pitstain, for example, most of these nodes are 64 gigabytes for the CPU. Some of them are 128 gigabytes, but the GPU is only 16. And what you can do is is you can actually use Dask as well. So um, Dask actually operate and can interoperate with CuPy. And so you have your CuPy array and then you can convert that into a Dask array. And then Dask will be able to manage um, the memory both if you were just using the single node, but also you would be able to go to multiple nodes. And the reason for that is that Dask also has a distributed scheduler I think that on the first day Raphael, with Raphael, we looked at the processes scheduler and the threads scheduler. It's also a distributed scheduler. And what you could do is you could start um, in, a, in a similar way to what we saw with IPy Parallel, you can start a kind of controller and then a set of engines. And then you will be able to um, you send your CuPy array to um, the memory of GPUs that are on distributed architecture like Pitstain. So let me just allow Theo and Vasily to come on. So first of all, are there any more questions about the MPI for Pi or IPy parallel part? Um, please jump on. And if not, please ask any questions about uh, what you've seen. Yes, well, oh, yeah. one more question Great. about MPI. Still yep. And um, so you told at the beginning that we can uh, send uh, uh, data to different machines, right? Yep. So we can use... Uh, how we define the different machines? So we have to set up some different endpoints or is uh, all automatic? Yeah, so you, so when you, so you start, uh, so with IPy parallel, when you start the controller, it will be, it will have an IP address. And then, so when you then start engines on other systems, you will pass something like dash dash IP and then the IP address of the controller. So then they will, the engines will um, be able to locate the controller and vice versa. Okay, so, so we, left, we, left, we, we were able to leave that out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we were able to leave that out because everything was running on the same node for us. So it was, so we just did IP engine and it could, it could find the controller. But otherwise, yeah, you just pass the dash dash IP, or it's something like that um, to the to the host of that's running the controller. And you could, you could then run over SSH or 
through MPI, um, MPI through your network or whatever. So just to answer the question uh, that was asked before, uh, what we can do in a situation where one GPU is not enough, the memory is not enough, so we cannot allocate a single CUPI array. So CUPI allows you to, to use multiple GPUs if they are available on a single node. And combined with MPI for Pi, not the current stable version, but the next uh, version of M MPI for Pi, actually the development version that uh, you can download now and test uh, is compatible with CUPI arrays as long as the underlying MPI is CUDA aware. So you can uh, more or less uh, exchange G CUPI GPU arrays between uh, different nodes without having first to, to copy the array to the host. As long as uh, the MPI support, uh, that the underlying uh, MPI supports is uh, CUDA, CUDA aware. And this is something that uh, you have to search based on the MPI implementation that you are using and enable it if you are configuring uh, MPI by yourself. But the next version of, uh, of uh, MPI for Pi supports that and you can uh, operate both with CUPI arrays and number arrays that uh, are allocated on the GPU. So you can directly exchange this. Tim, there are a couple of questions. One I think is about MPI profiling. Could you? Sure, so Francesco asks about um, tools for, uh, first of all, debugging MPI. And so, yeah, so, so debugging of parallel code is, it can be tricky at times, all right? And so I guess there are, the indus, there are a couple of um, commercial products that are popular at uh, high performance computing sites. So one of them is called the DDT. And that is the one that we have at CSS. And that comes from Alenia, which is now owned by ARM. But it, it costs money. Yeah. So <laughs> um, and if you don't have access to that, then um, it's not necessarily so easy. Uh, I can answer the question from Aloik. So the question is, how do you know if a workflow is worth it to be parallelized? I've tried to implement some of the things learned in the class on my data analysis, and they're less efficient <laughs> than the standard code. Well, I mean, this is, that's a good question. And uh, I, I will start the opposite way. Usually when you start, yeah, it might be slower, but this doesn't mean that there is no uh, parallelization opportunity. So essentially, you need to understand your algorithm. So uh, to understand whether there is uh, um, uh, there are opportunities to parallelize, like there are no dependencies or there are steps that can happen in parallel. And after you do that, um, and then there is there is also a basic uh, law, which is called Amdahl's law. So if you can't parallelize, I mean, even a, a part of your application, then um, uh, you might be limited, you will be limited in the actual speed up that you will take. So you have first to see which parts and for what amount of time they account for uh, can be, are actually parallel, it can be parallelized. That's the first step. And then after you do that, then you start looking into if, especially we're talking about GPUs, data transfers, whether you can parallelize uh, or overlap or avoid multiple data transfers, and then you go on and go on. But as a general rule of thumb, I would say understand your problem and see, um, uh, try to rule out parallelization, pro uh, serialization problems. Hope that answer your question. And just to go back to um, to Francesco, so it also talked about profiling 
of MPI code. And so the, um, the MPI standard, it actually includes a profiling interface. So this is that for starters. And then of course there are various tools. So um, MPIP, I think is one of them, uh, which is a, a free or non-commercial. And then there are, of course, also some commercial options and vendor specific ones. So on the Cray machine, we have um, a tool called CrayPat, uh, which does profiling of MPI applications. And again, on depending on the vendor of your of your machine, there's probably some other uh, vendor specific tools. For the question of Hannes, uh, I think simply we we didn't think about it. Maybe it's a good uh, suggestion for for the next edition of the course. We always saw TensorFlow more like uh, related to to people interested in deep learning. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's true. Uh, yeah, I think we can we can think about some examples and maybe for the next uh, course we can add it. Yeah, thank you. We have already you have already organized the dedicated course for that. Right. Uh, yeah. The past. So just to chime in again for the follow-up question from Giordano, where he says, we have seen Numba and Cupido interact with GPU from Python. How they handle a situation where I use Numba.cuda code or Cupai arrays, but I don't have a GPU. With TensorFlow, this would be free as they have CPU API. Well, I can answer for the Numba CUDA part uh, there it's, as you've seen, is quite much more manual. So it really looks like in one, one uh, to CUDA. Now for Kupai, uh, Teo, uh, so, so to answer your question, there you would need an, a layer on top of that. But uh, for Kupai, I don't know, I can give it to Teo. Yeah, also from, from, from the number point of view, what, that's why what we separated the, the course in to different sessions uh, for the for the part of the GPU and the CPU, because from for from the number point of view, it's completely different what you have to do when you when you are programming something for the GPU. So if if uh, if, if a GPU is not, is not available in your system and you try to use the CUDA JIT, uh, well, number will start complaining, of course. Uh, with Cupai, the situation is a little bit different because. Uh, Kupai more or less uh, tries to be uh, compatible with with NumPy as soon as as much as possible. So as you saw from my example, you can uh, uh, check the array, and if it's the array that you are passing to a function uh, is is not a GPU one but it's a NumPy one, then it will use the NumPy module. So you can make your code generic like that. But of course, you cannot use uh, element-wise kernels and stuff like that with NumPy. Then you, you will have to have a, a GPU on your system. Also, uh, Kupai also has experimental support at the moment for uh, AMD GPUs. But in general, uh, you need a GPU accelerator to, to be able to use it. Otherwise, you, you have to stick with, uh, with pure NumPy. And in, in the number case, uh, you cannot do these uh, uh, kernels. You will stick with uh, the typical uh, NG, uh, the vectorize with target uh, CPU or target parallel. There is also the vectorize with target CUDA, but then it will complain as soon as it tries to, to compile the kernel because it, it will not find the, the corresponding uh, libraries that it needs to do so. So for number, if you do the number.s, it will give you all the information about the system. It will tell you that it found CUDA or whatever. Otherwise, it, when it tries to compile the kernel, it will complain. Yeah, as I, as I said, the question is any Python library for non-CUDA GPUs. So number has support for ROC, so it supports uh, AMD GPUs. Uh, I haven't tried it myself uh, because we have uh, CUDA GPUs uh, on pitch time, 
uh, and also Kupai uh, are have experimental support for Rocky. So I think that the, at, in the future uh, you will be able to use uh, with both without any problem. As a follow-up of the to the answer of Vasily about the the, the parallelization and the distribution, uh, and then some tips uh, that also can can help you to to debug what, what is happening. Since you said that this is lower now, I guess you you can start by parallelizing only very small tiny parts of the code of the code one by one, and then you can check the non-parallel version. Uh, compared to the other one, and you can have a look to top and see if uh, the the non-parallel the, the original version is already multi-threaded. In, in that case, maybe uh, adding uh, distribution is going just to to make it worse. And the other thing is uh, also with top the distributed version, you can have a look if it is actually using uh, more than hundred percent. You know, using many many CPUs because of the, the thing with the guild. It can happen that it's just switching from one thread to the other one, but executing everything concurrently. Those are some, some tips you can have a look. Also, uh, for non-CUDA non GPUs, there is also PyOpenCL that you can check. It's uh, similar to PyCuda, but for uh, writing OpenCL code and interacting with from Python. But it, it's difficult to have one, uh, even if you had the same code running on the CPUs and the GPUs, because the architecture is completely different, then you have to take uh, other things into account, like uh, memory transfers, for example, uh, when, you, when you have on CPU, uh, the data don't need to be memory transferred, while on the GPUs you have to account for this. So it's not that you have that it's easy to have a version that is aware where it's running and it will uh, run uh, with the best performance in both cases. So let me ask it, ask the participants a question. So we've seen lots of different techniques. We've seen uh, Scython, F2Pi, CFFI, Numba, QPi. Um, is there anything that has jumped out at you and said, wow, yeah, okay, that's really cool. I'm gonna to try to use that in my project. Please feel free to come onto the mic, it would be great. Nothing was so cool. Or all of them were so cool, they don't know where, what to choose. <laughs> yeah. I really liked um, Numba so far. And uh, this parallel MPI for Pi. And Dask. I'm not so, con I mean, Kupai, okay, all, all GPU stuff. And then I'm not, so, let's say I'm not so convinced by Cyton or, uh, CFFI, I thought they, were, they would have been better, but I don't know. I look, I mean, I don't look so simple to use them or straightforward or useful. I mean, I, I start, if I most of the time I start from scratch when I don't have any pre existing code, so I think I will use Numba first and then maybe extend with some other Kupai or something like that before having to use like actual C code if I start from Python. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know how to optimize the code, like with intent intrinsics, all that stuff, but uh, uh, it doesn't look so straightforward to me other than just use Numba or, or the other things, I would say, for new code, let's say. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. It's really good. What, would you have been interested also in hearing more about Dask? 
um, because Dask is quite quite useful because you can, as I say, you can use it for generic um, parallel stuff as well as these NumPy like APIs. Also, also called Pandas. Um, I, I heard that Dask is a part of some bigger like numerical Python project from from Conda, yeah, the, right? Yeah, the probably non focused. Yeah. Yeah, probably it could be an overview. I mean, they're, I think they're all connected, right? Like, uh, like yeah. pandas and the, so it should be all. So, I mean, maybe an overview of that would be interesting in this optic. Since yeah. it seems like high HPC focus. Yeah, they actually just recently spun off a company um, called. Um, Anyone can remember it's got something to do with snakes. Uh, uh, coiled, coiled. Um, so some of the people who were very um, much involved in the development of Dask, uh, so Matt Rocklin and some others, uh, they now have a company called Coiled, where they're focused on um, basically getting people to, to scale up their Python using Dask. And a lot of the people that were involved with Dask were in NVIDIA or and or these this non focus group and everything. So yeah, they're all they're all a bit tied together, pandas and numpy. The idea is that they can all work together. Um, there's a question from Hannes in the QA about um, how to zip up the directory. So maybe I can just quickly share my screen and I'll show you from show you directly about how to download the work. Okay. So just go into, uh, not, not there, start again. Go into Python HPC, click on JupyterLab, Click on zero zero materials and run the cell at the bottom. So basically you're just doing a tar of this home slash Python HPC directory. I'll just run it myself. Da, 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 da. And then you will see that it will appear in your directory structure, this tar.gz, and then you can just right click, and then you can go download. Okay. So the important thing to note is that it's in the Jupyter Lab directory and it's 00 materialsipy notebook. Let me know and let us know in the Q and A whether you successfully managed to to grab everything. The accounts should stay um, active until at least midnight tonight and possibly tomorrow as well. So, um, although the reservation will not be current, um, so you you will not need to launch your notebook with the HPC Python reservation, you'll be able to launch just directly with the defaults um, from the front page. Definitely until midnight tonight, possibly slightly longer. Um. Rafael, can oh, you before, uh, yeah just before Francesco's question so if you if you cannot find if you cannot download according to those instructions oh yeah if it's successful okay great thanks um, yeah Rafael can probably answer Francesco's question about uh, mini conda to get a list conda list yeah uh, let me use a second to find the command and I paste it in the in the in the chat
Okay, I'll reverse my question from earlier from the other side. Uh, were, was there something that you had kind of hoped to see that would be covered here that wasn't? Um, something that you would have, or, or something that would have been better to have had more in depth look at? I, I pasted the, 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 the command. Is a conda minus minus list, no, list minus minus explicit, and that one uh, it will give you a, a list of, uh, of all the packages that are inside, and then later uh, you can do conda install and pass this file, and uh, it will kind of reproduce the same uh, the same environment. Probably there are things that are not going to be reproduced because. Uh, uh, maybe uh, install uh, Jupyter, things like that by with pip, but the rest of the conda packages are going to be there. So I guess it should be to, to, to do conda install with that, that file. And then the, uh, the rest uh, add some stuff like Jupyter with uh, pip install, okay? So nothing that immediately comes to mind that was missing or you thought uh, you would have loved to have heard some more about. You can also type pip freeze in, uh, in a notebook cell probably to give you a, an output. Um, of the environment, just make sure you have that mini conda Python HPC kernel running. Just type pip freeze. You don't need to use the exclamation mark at the beginning. You can just type it straight into the cell. Uh, I think. Uh, well, I'm not sure if that will give everything there. Yeah, so the last question. Uh, so we have to. You're terminalizing if do you have the, the command? Can you uh, uh, connect it through the microphone? Do you have the conda um, command? Uh, yes, yes, but I open a terminal, like this is, it's in base. I do uh, think we are using another environment, right? We're not in base, correct? No, no, it's in base, it's in base. Ah, okay, yeah. so, so, yeah. okay, so first. Yeah, it's in base. We just, we named the kernel. Um, Okay. When we were using Jupyter, we called that Python HPC, but the actual Conda environment is just base. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat, sorry, how much time uh, the count will be act active? It should be until it should be until midnight tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. But the reservation will end at 6 p.m. today. So, so then you should just, um, if you want to launch a notebook, um, you just go with the defaults from the front page form. Don't, don't put HPC underscore Python into the advanced reservation field. Just leave that empty. Okay, thanks very much, Hannes. It's um, 
it's great to have you in the course as well. And I'm glad that you found some, some cool stuff. Thank you very much. It would be great to hear from people um, following up. If you do implement some of these techniques in your, in your projects, um, send us an email. Um, you know at least some of our email addresses because you would have received the uh, information about the course from probably from Raphael or Guilherme. So yeah, please let us know if, if you do manage to use these in a, in a real world application, it's great. And I think there'll also probably be a feedback form, um, at least like a you know feedback survey that you should receive in the next few days. Um, but for yeah, it's it's also nice you know in a, in a few months' time if you if you successfully implement something, then let us know. It would be great to hear, rather than just you know immediate feedback about specifics of the course, because ultimately it's the most important thing is whether you can actually make use of these in a real project. And it's not something that you're gonna be able to know at the time that you fill out the survey. Thanks, Devendra. Yeah. So probably a final call for questions. Um, otherwise, we can think about wrapping it up. Uh, hi, Tim. Um, hi. I asked a question about setting up um, Jupiter Lab on a machine on Monday. Oh. Um, and I just wanted to ask the follow up question. So I usually access the machine I work on remotely. Um, and I was trying to set it up last night, but I was on successful. And I was just wondering do you have to set up Jupiter as a remote server or something on the machine or? Okay, so so normally you connect to the machine with SSH, do you? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so if you can tunnel the network um, back to your laptop, then you should just be able to run the Jupyter server on the, on the remote machine. However, it depends on exactly the remote machine. <laughs> so um, yeah. is it... Is it a cluster or is it a, a, a login node? It's, um, it's like a small server essentially. Okay, so it should, it should be possible. Um, yeah. Maybe we can, maybe it's easier if we just talk offline. Um, sure. I'll, send, I'll send you my email address um, separately after the course and then we should be able to get you up and running. So as long as you can um, forward the network traffic, tunnel it back to your local machine, it could be pretty easy to get set up. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. I can answer the container question because it's I'm working with containers now in general. So Docker per se, you cannot run on pitch line because you need uh, root access and you need also a, a daemon running. But uh, we have Sarus and Singularity, which are two projects which are uh, tailored for HPC. And uh, 
you can transfer your .NET container uh, on pitch dined and run at scale or pull a container image that you have on Docker Hub or another container registry and run. We have, uh, I will send you, I will copy the, the link that we have the instructions to do so. Yeah, so, so basically in a nutshell, you, we don't actually run Docker per se, but you can run containers. Um, you can run Docker containers on Pitstain. <laughs> That's the, the simple answer, yeah. And also thank you, Camila, for the, feed, for the feedback um, and also for asking lots of questions during the, during the course that made it a little bit easier because as you can imagine doing it, um, remotely, it's, it's not so easy to get the interactivity that we're used to, to when we're giving these types of courses. So it's really good when people ask questions. So I appreciate that. As you can see that even ourselves, we're not in the same room. We're all uh, working from home and or different places. So yeah, it's really good to have the interactivity. Thank you. So I don't see the, the question somehow it disappeared, but did you get the link for the containers? I can see the link and I think it just moved up because I voted the question up. So on the top, you can see it. <laughs> you got the link as of the... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's it's there. Okay, good. Sorry, the oh, yeah. So once the questions are answered, they they then move according to how many upvotes that they got. It's very uh, confusing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so also, um, I put a link for the for a for a um a parallel debugger as well in one of the questions earlier. So um, which the the product formerly known as DDT, which is now called something else. Uh, Forge, a, a linear forge or arm forge, even. Uh, so yeah, maybe scroll through the Q and A um, before you leave, just to make sure we haven't missed yes, anything. So yeah, Theo has put a, a, a link to the to the containers. Um, basically, as he mentioned, we use a, a, a tool called Salrus, and you can effectively convert your Docker container. Yeah, so to be able to run. And you can also run on singular you can use singularity as well. Yeah. One one general comment about I see a lot of uh, uh, on the QA a lot of uh, people saying that uh, it's good that you saw the different tools and that's basically what we wanted also to not focus on one specific uh, specific tool but let you know also what's out there. And in the end, it's, it's you who, who try, who, you can try these uh, tools and uh, uh, decide which is uh, appropriate for, for your work. Because some of the tools may give you better results, but you will have to, uh, to invest more onto them, while others uh, are, will give you uh, quicker solutions, but might not be uh, that uh, you may not have the great performance that you need. So it's always uh, uh, good to know what's out there. And that's why we keep updating the course because Python is uh, really popular now with all the data science and machine learning stuff is happening. And so new tools come out all the time. Yeah, thanks Francesco and thanks Cornelia. We appreciate the feedback. Definitely be in touch with us if you do 
manage to turn this into something that you're that you're running in your production. Okay, I think that it's it's basically four o'clock, so let's call it a call it a day. <laughs> As I say, thanks everyone for joining. Hope you learned something. It sounds like you have, um, and yeah, we've given a, a few different tools and techniques that you can try out. And yeah, send us some feedback. Let us know if you use it, and uh, look forward to seeing you on on another course. Uh, probably it's going to be virtual for the next little while foreseeable future i guess but um maybe in person one day and otherwise we'll see you again on the next virtual one so thanks very much everyone thank you all bye thank you thank you bye bye, bye. 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 bye.